from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Tech. While trade tensions continue, grain exports at a remarkable pace. How much would a trade aid package pay out? We have new estimates. In agribusiness, can soybeans rally? Uh, you should be patient with prices. Citrus growers in Florida may find themselves with a much better crop. And this Missouri church found a way to restore its past and preserve its future. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Trade, weather, and markets, the three issues top of mind for farmers in mid-August. Growers continuing to hope for clarity on two of those concerns in the coming weeks. New reports this week, another cargo ship loaded with American soybeans is headed for China. Bloomberg reporting the 60,000 metric ton ship is on its way despite fresh import duties on American ag goods. Now analysts say it, it is proof that China won't be able to fully shun American supplies. Well, new numbers from USDA show exports of grain in all forms is on track to set a fresh record for the 2017-2018 year. With two months of sales left to report, the U.S. Grains Council says so far the U.S. has exported 98.3 million metric tons of grain. That's in all forms now and up 2% year over year. Exports are on pace to exceed 116 million metric tons, which would be a record for the second year in a row. The record flying in the face of a turbulent trade year, including renegotiations of NAFTA, a trade war with China, clashes with the European Union. Exports to both NAFTA partners are up year over year. Corn sales to Mexico rising nearly 9%, while Canadian imports have nearly doubled. Exports of grain in all forms to NAFTA partners may top 31 million metric tons this marketing year. Shipments to the EU, they're up 84%. The biggest sector of these grains in all forms continues to be ethanol. Now on track for another record export year as well, nearing 1.6 billion gallons. Meanwhile, former Iowa governor and current U.S. ambassador to China says trade talks are happening between the U.S. and China. Telling crowds at the Iowa State Fair, the administration is aiming to double ag exports to China over the next five years. Brandstad telling reporters that they're continuing to have discussions and they've had several meetings, adding that U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has also been talking with Chinese officials over the past two weeks. The White House plan to support farmers during negotiations continues to be a hot topic. New analysis from the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri is showing the $12 billion trade war mitigation plan needs more details. According to the FAPRI head Pat Westhoff, payments for soybean farmers could range anywhere from $0.25 cents to $1 per bushel. Now he thinks those payments would be based on a producer's actual production, not on a county's average yield. Probably the biggest concern we've heard in Missouri has been that we have a lot of producers in northwest Missouri who were hit hard by drought this year who won't have as much of a crop to sell. And so because they won't have much of a crop to sell, they won't call out for many payments. Westhoff making it clear that there needs to be more clarity and direction on payments, which he says could happen once the aid package is finalized. The factory numbers are only preliminary estimates. It's not just grains feeling the pinch of Chinese trade tensions. Pork imports to the Asian nation also falling. WH Group, the China-based owner of Smithfield, says trade tensions and falling domestic prices are changing where it's shipping its pork. U.S. executives at Smithfield saying volumes to China have dropped by 20 to 30 percent, but shipments to Korea are up 50 percent. China is the world's biggest pork producer, consumer, and importer. It increased duties on U.S. pork to 37% in April and then to 62% in July. USDA using its authority to declare multiple counties in the Central Plains as primary natural disaster areas due to drought. Mike Hoffman has details in today's Crop Comments. Mike. Good morning, Clinton. USDA designating multiple counties in drought-stricken states as primary natural disaster areas. Ag producers who suffered losses and damages due to a recent drought may be eligible for Farm Service Agency emergency loans. 25 counties in Missouri receiving the drought designation. Those states are primarily in the northern third of the state, which is under D3 or extreme drought conditions. This is one example of how drought has hurt corn production in the state. 
This is near Hardin, Missouri in Ray County, one of the 25 Missouri counties declared as a natural disaster area. Eight counties in Kansas received, received the designation as well. Six of the locations are Collar counties near Kansas City. Two are in the southeast corner of the state near Joplin. Two counties in Oklahoma also received the drought designation. Producers in neighboring counties may also qualify. And taking a look at the uh, wind speed forecast, you can see a little bit of wind from uh, southern Illinois down into Texas as we start the day today. A little bit more and some thunderstorms in the, the Ohio Valley, central Mississippi Valley and parts of the west this afternoon. Heading into the day tomorrow, we'll start off kind of breezy uh, in places from the eastern Great Lakes down to Texas. And then those winds increase, obviously as we hit the afternoon, especially in areas where thunderstorms develop. We'll have your forecast coming up, but first here are some hometown temps. Keeping track of the shifting market prices has never been so easy. Get the latest commodity prices sent directly to your cell phone with market updates. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. Below normal cold temperatures last winter in Louisiana, drastically reducing giant salvinia, an invasive weed from South America. Each summer, it chokes Louisiana waterways. Unfortunately, the cold also reduced the population of giant salvinia weevils, which are a biological control for the weed. Craig Gotro has details in this report provided by the LSU Ag Center. A severe winter across Louisiana caused much of the giant salvinia in the state to die off, especially in the northern part of the state. However, the weather also caused a drastic reduction of a weevil being used to control the salvinia. The salvinia is now rebounding and creating problems. Instead of seeing our normal infestations in late spring, we are now moving into summer to see, um, before we saw our giant salvinia infestations create big mats to where they were problematic for waterways. Wall has ponds across the state where he raises weevils to help combat giant salvinia. Weevil populations in the wild and in some of his ponds were decimated from the severe winter cold. We saw a big decrease in the, uh, the uh, density of adult, salv of, uh, adult salvinia weevils, um, and we saw a big lag time before they started reproducing and producing uh, uh, larvae as well. Salvinia can be controlled by chemical spraying, but weevils are a more viable solution. Chemical control, relying just on chemical control alone is very costly and is a, a short-term, small-scale solution to, to the problem. Common salvinia, a relative of giant salvinia, is also causing some concern. You wouldn't find it as widespread as you would giant salvinia. This year, when we're monitoring and going out, we have actually started to see an increase in uh, common salvinia infestations around southern Louisiana. While the giant salvinia weevil can forage on common salvinia, it is not an effective control for the plant. It can feed on, on common salvinia and get enough to live a little bit longer. It's not reproducing. It's not viable habitat for it to, con to uh, control common salvinia. In areas the weevil population has reached high enough levels, giant salvinia has been kept in check. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. When we come back, we'll look at the upside potential of soybeans and later a Missouri community rallies together to refresh and restore the historic church. Don't miss the 2018 Farm Progress Show, August 28th through August 30th in Boone, Iowa. Visit farmprogressshow.com for more information and to purchase tickets online. The latest flash report from the Association of Equipment Manufacturers says overall sales of tractors and combines posting strong gains in July. Year to date, combine sales are up 37% compared to the first seven months of 2017. Sales of four wheel drive tractors were also higher, up 13% year to date. AEM says the numbers aren't favorable, but there are concerns about the second half of the year due to uncertainty around trade and tariffs. In markets, much of the grains back in the green on Tuesday. Let's get details from the floor of the CME in Chicago. In soybeans, it really is recovering uh, from the fallout from the report on Friday. The futures are climbing back from that new low that it made. It's kind of a multi-week low. The trend is still weak and uh, lower, but uh, for now, it seems that traders are looking at these prices are kind of like a bargain value, so they're going to step up and start to buy them a little bit. And I think the dry weather is starting to seep its way into the market somewhat. It's given it a little bit of a lift. Corn also rallied today. Uh, wheat also rebounded. Now, speculators just stopped the liquidation, and thank goodness, because uh, it was really getting a little bit overdone. Today, cattle firmed up. Those beef cutout prices and the demand were a little bit higher today, and that gave the market somewhat of a lift. That's all from the floor at the CME Group here in Chicago. I'm Virginia McGaffey. 
Soybeans have been on a wild ride the last few weeks from seeing prices climb to a near free fall after USDA's latest report. In analysis this morning, Tyne Morgan asked whether bean prices can find room to rally. Here now with Brian Split of Allendale. Brian, when we look at the soybean market, there's been so much negative news. A lot of that negative news priced into soybeans. Um, we've seen it come back a little bit, but do you think we can continue to increase soybean prices heading into harvest? I do, and we don't know exactly what the yield's going to be, and it's going to be a while till we find out. But I think the market does have a habit of rallying into the uh, month of October for the fall price average for crop insurance levels. Uh, and I would also suggest that if you're thinking ahead to new crop, uh, you should be patient with prices yet. Uh, 11, out of the past 11 years, we've seen new crop soybeans trade over $10 every single year, and the, the lowest of those high prices was $10.45. So I think there's a very good chance that we'll see a good marketing opportunity for new crop next year. Okay, so you mentioned new crop. You think there's a marketing opportunity. What about those producers right now that are sitting on old crop beans? We know a lot more producers took advantage of prices and got rid of some old crop beans, uh, but those that still have some to move, what should they do at this point? I'd be surprised if there were a lot of old crops still out there that's unpriced, but um, at this point I think, you know, be patient. The basis isn't suggesting that uh, you want to move the, the market right now. Uh, so I, I'd sit on it for a little bit and, and look for the market to go up before you um, make your pricing decisions. And new crop, when you're looking at $10 range that we have seen that every year, I mean, how long do, we, do you think we have to hold on for that to happen? It's hard to say what's going to be the driver, um, but you know, since 2007, no matter how bearish the market seemed it could be, we've seen an opportunity over 10. Uh, a lot of times during the winter months, you'll get a, a three to four month time frame where you'll actually trade over 10 for a while to make sure we garner the appropriate acres, and I think you'll get that opportunity again this year. All right, Brian Split of Allendale, thank you so much. We need to take a quick break, have a check of weather, and then we'll be back with much more Ag Day. To talk to Brian Split one-on-one, -on -one, call Allendale Incorporated at 800-551-4626 or email him at bsplit at allendale-inc.com. Advice, information, ideas, and more. If it's ag tech, it's in the tech tool shed. Your unbiased, one-stop source for everything ag tech. Welcome back to Ag Day Meteorologist Mike Hoffman looking at the root zone moisture map. And Mike, if you look at this, there's that big bullseye right in the middle of the of the corn belt, really. I know it. And uh, any rain that tries to come into there, it seems like it tends to dry up, which is typical when you get into a really dry situations. There still will be some rain over the next day, day and a half for parts of this real dry area in the middle of the country, but uh, just not sure it's going to help a whole lot. We'll see when it's all said and done. We're also getting a little drier in North Dakota and in northern Minnesota, as you can see. Some wet areas in the east with that storm that's just been sitting there, especially eastern Pennsylvania. Also, parts of Texas suddenly on the wet side, at least in the root zone areas of the soil. Now, take a look at the uh, map this morning. There's that storm system moving through uh, central and northern Missouri. You can see our model not showing a whole lot of uh, rain there on the north side of that system as you typically get in this situation. But as it heads into uh, Illinois and Indiana, should be spreading some showers and even thunder uh, storms into parts of that area. Also a cool front uh, coming southward. And of course you have the hit and miss stuff uh, southeast, southwest uh, each afternoon. Heading into the day tomorrow then, the storm system moving through northern Indiana at the 7 a.m. time frame tomorrow and uh, with showers and thunderstorms across that area southward into uh, parts of Kentucky and Tennessee. And that'll spread eastward as we head through the day. But also some hit and miss showers and thunderstorms back to the west. Southeast and southwest, like I said, typical for this time of the year. Precipitation estimates past 24 hours. This storm has put down some decent rains in places, but other places haven't seen a whole lot. There's big, big dry areas in the middle of that storm at times. Heading through the next 36 hours, you can see how it spreads across parts of Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and into the central portions of the Great Lakes. Checking out temperatures this afternoon, still hot and muggy to the south. A little bit more comfortable uh, than you have seen across the northern plains. As you can see, Great Lakes and Ohio Valley, lots of 70s and 80s for highs. Temperatures tomorrow morning, we'll see 50s and 60s across the northern plains behind that frontal system, but still 70s by the time you get to the lower Great Lakes southward. And uh, during the afternoon tomorrow, a lot of 80s across the Corn Belt, 90s farther south, obviously. Here's the jet stream. You can see little ripples in it with those storm systems moving from west to east. We still kind of have a trough as we head through the uh, weekend, but a bigger trough looks like it's coming for the middle parts of next week for the east. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. 
First of all, for Casper, Wyoming, lots of sunshine and hot today, high of 89 degrees. Waco, Texas, partly sunny, hot and humid, high of 97. And finally, Dayton, Ohio, rather humid, a thunderstorm in spots, high temperature around 84. After a tumultuous few years, Florida citrus growers are finding reasons to be optimistic. We'll tell you why after the break. And later, we're off to the Show Me State, where this country church is finding a way to preserve its future. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. It appears Florida orange growers may be catching a break this year, at least so far. Bloomberg News says the state may produce 70 million boxes of oranges this year. That compares to 45 million last year, which was the smallest output since the end of World War II. As we've been reporting, orange production in Florida has been shrinking over the past decade due to the Asian citrus psyllid, the pest spreads of bacteria called citrus greening. Now on top of that, last year the state's orange groves got walloped by Hurricane Irma in September. USDA will issue its first estimate for the upcoming season in October. Now across the country to the Pacific Northwest, pear growers are facing a big harvest this year. Our reporting partners at the Packers say Northwest pear growers are starting the harvest season with an estimated 20 million 44 pound box equivalents, which is the fourth largest crop in history. The Pear Bureau Northwest says an earlier estimate for the crop at just under 19 million boxes. Now the Packer says harvest started about a week earlier than last year, but closer to the historical start date. Pear harvest in the Pacific Northwest typically runs through September. And new research from the food marketing firm Package Facts says yogurt, especially Greek yogurt, is still a popular breakfast food, but these days people want it on the go. The industry has seen 20% growth this year in drinkable yogurt. Package Facts expects that growth to continue another 13% in five years. The research firm says cold cereal remains the most popular breakfast food among adults with young children. Older generations are more likely to purchase hot cereal. Well, up next, a Missouri congregation steps up to preserve its past and its future. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota's M7060, built to get the job done. See KubotaUSA.com or your local Kubota dealer for more information. It's a small town church facing similar struggles as other churches planted in rural communities. The congregation's numbers may not be growing, but to celebrate 150 years, Norburn, Missouri's Lutheran Church took on a major renovation. And the congregation raised the money in only eight weeks. Time Morgan has her story. It's a steeple church and congregation that's a staple in this community of 600. This congregation was formed in 1869. So it will be celebrating its sesquicentennial next year. A church that dug its roots just after the community did. The building that we're in uh, was built in 1890. It's a church that showed its age with a community stepping up in the form of much needed TLC. It started probably maybe five years ago. We talked about uh, renovating the Jesus statue not knowing where it was going to be going from there. But it's the latest transformation helping to revamp the beauty of a building nearly 130 years old. The renovation that you see now uh, is one that was completed just uh, about eight months ago. The renovation this time was focused not only on the outside, but inside these wooden doors, where the church wore colors and features that represented a look from the 1960s. We hired an architect who specializes in um, traditional church architecture. The goal was to get back to the church's heritage, a church formed by German immigrants. And asked him to give us a plan that would make the inside look like a 19th century German Lutheran church. From refinishing the pews with a retro coloring to putting in new floors, the church came with a new look. And that's kind of what we were after, getting back to the original church. While still keeping cornerstone pieces of the past. The baptismal font was uh, with the original building in 1890. The altar behind me uh, was with uh, it's an original piece from the 1890 church. Overall, it was a job that was no easy task. You had to end up tearing the ceiling completely off. With all local people putting in the labor and skill for the custom work. And, and good work too. Work that signifies the commitment of the church. 
But I think the remodeling actually was an indication of the, the, the feeling that there is a future for this congregation in this community. With the congregation's praise of the work shining through. Well, I'm impressed. <laughs> Well, that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us. For Mike Hoffman, Tyne Morgan, and all of us here at Ag Dam, Clinton Grivis, have a great day.